I'm here with Dr. David Janicki, Pro Associate Professor of Clinical and Health Psychology at the University of Florida. And today we're going to be talking about pediatric obesity. Um, thank you very much for being here with us. Thanks today. for having me. Um, my first question is, if a parent is concerned about their child's weight, um, how do they know or when should they seek help and services? When do they know it's a serious problem? Okay. Well, I think one thing, an important thing, is you know, looking at a child's weight relative to their height. And you often hear the terms BMI or body mass index. And you know, it's a simple ratio of looking at height relative to weight. Um, but for kids, you know, because kids are constantly growing, there's a little bit of a formula. So it gets complicated. I think the best thing to do to kind of determine where a child falls in that is to meet with your primary care doc or your physician. Um, ask them, say, I'm wondering about my child's weight. How is he or she doing? Um, and they can get, you know, measure them for height and weight and then calculate and look at uh, growth charts for boys and girls at specific ages to see where they fall. Alternatively, there are some great websites that a parent can go to, whether it's the USDA's myplate.com, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, there are others where you can um, type in your child's height and weight and then it will tell you what their BMI percentile is and what category they may fall on if they're obese or overweight or in the non-overweight range. If a parent finds out that their child is obese or significantly overweight and needs some treatment, what kinds of treatments are available to help children? I think the treatment that's received the most attention and probably has the most evidence to back it up, non-medication intervention, is a comprehensive behavioral family lifestyle intervention. And the focus of those interventions are to work with the child and their parent and really try to affect change in the whole family. And the focus will be on certainly helping the child and other members of the family develop healthier eating habits. Right? trying to cut back a little bit on high fat, high sugar, less than optimal foods, increase consumption of water, calcium, milk, um, fruits and vegetables. So trying to make uh, a better choices in what you're eating and also trying to get kids and families to be more active, how they can get more physically active in the day and cutting back on how much time they engage in sedentary activities like watching TV or playing video games. Um, and these interventions often really focus times on helping kids and families work together. How can they communicate effectively? How can parents um, uh, support their kids through positive interactions? How can they set up limits and give kids choices to make healthy changes without turning it into, you know, an argument and, and banging heads? And how can parents model effective changes for their kids? You know, this is an example where doing what I say but not what I do, you know, that's not going to work. Okay, parents have to model effective changes. So, you know, I'm getting into more detail here, but a behavior family interventions kind of work on all those components. Um, and oftentimes you can talk with your primary care provider about where a behavior family intervention might be available for you in your local area. On the other hand, you know, oftentimes you can work with uh, your primary care doc or maybe work with a dietitian or a nutritionist in your area that can focus on elements of being more educated on eating a well-balanced diet and then trying to you know, select uh, portions of that to try to get kids to make healthier choices. So I think a good starting point is always with your doctor and family physician. Hopefully they can point you in the right direction. So it sounds like what you were saying, the evidence-based treatment um, that has the most support is this very comprehensive yes. behavioral treatment yeah. um, for which parents are pretty heavily involved. Mm -hmm. Can Absolutely. you um, describe a little bit about exactly what role parents should play mm -hmm. um, for their child or adolescent who is um, kind of trying to become healthier? And Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great question because I think most would agree that parental involvement in helping kids establish healthy activities is absolutely critical because parents you know, set up the environment, they really gauge and, and determine what's available for the kids in the environment, they set examples for their children. You know, as kids get older, certainly peers, especially in adolescents, have an important role, but parents still provide a foundation for kids. So it's critical. 
You know, what are the things that parents can do? I'll go through a couple of these, and I touched on these a second ago. You know, first and foremost to me is modeling effective and healthy habits themselves. So if we want our kids to eat more healthy, if we want our you know, little Sally to eat more fruits and vegetables, mom and dad need to be seen eating more fruits and vegetables. Mom and dad need to be seen cutting back on how much soda they might drink. Um, so what they model for their kids is absolutely essential, number one. Number two, I think having healthy options in the home environment is critical. You know, we call this uh, stimulus control, which I would say, you know, controlling the cues that kids see. Oftentimes, you know, we don't necessarily eat when they're hungry, but when we're hungry, we see a cue, we're walking by, and ah, there's a cookie on the table. Grab it, okay? What we need to do are those less than optimal choices need to be out of sight. Put them in the back of the refrigerator, put them in the back of the cupboard, areas where it's a little bit tougher to get at, and also limit what foods are available in the home. I don't think anyone's saying that a, children, a child can't have a cookie or a piece of pizza. That's part of being a kid, it's part of being anybody. But we need to make sure that they're not so ubiquitous in the home. And alternatively, have healthy foods that we want the kids to choose more often, much more readily available and seen. So fruits and vegetables on the counter, in a glass bowl, other healthy options, you know, instead of having the Gatorade and the soda in the front, put them in the back and have, you know, skim milk or low-fat milk in the front of the refrigerator, okay? Healthy snack options, right, like potato chips in the back, maybe raisins or pretzels, you know, I'm not saying they're perfect, but in areas that are more accessible. So stimulus control is critical. I think. Um, making sure as parents we monitor a little bit more and be more aware of what our kids are eating. And sometimes that may, you know, involve for a day or two trying to write down more specifically what your kids are eating because oftentimes we're really surprised. We aren't aware of even, you know, let alone ourselves, what our kids are doing. So just being a little bit more diligent to get a little bit of a better idea of what those patterns might look like. And make sure that your kids are eating breakfast that they're not skipping meals. You know, eating breakfast is an important element of getting off to a good start in the day and then hopefully not overeating later in the day. And then, you know, last but not least, I would really focus on being positive and supportive, okay? How can we praise kids, give them more attention for their healthy choices that they do make? You know, give kids options between acceptable alternatives, setting limits for kids, we can't be afraid to say no. Now, I'm not saying no all the time, and I'm not saying yelling no at kids, but you know, at times saying, no, today we're not gonna do this, or today you're actually gonna have a choice between this and this, what would you like, okay? And then being very positive and praising kids for when they are making choices that we like to see. And you know, when kids maybe don't make the choice that we would hope they would, back off. We don't need to criticize and follow them and chastise, back off and wait till you see a healthier choice that they are making. Or make sure that, okay, maybe we got to do a better job of setting the environment up so that they have more cho chances to pick choices that we would want to see. And realize, you know, they're kids, right? We're adults. We always will make bad choices occasionally. You know, we need to focus on gradual changes and being supportive. So you told us a lot of great tips about what parents could be doing to yes. help their children. Now, is, are there things that parents should, that are not recommended in, in terms of they have these um, interventions mm -hmm. or treatments haven't really found to be beneficial for kids who are trying to get at a healthier weight? Sure. I think what I would focus on, maybe not specific intervention, but the attitudes we take and what we encourage and what we push on our kids. I um, mean, you know, there's certainly a debate on, you know, should we be trying to encourage kids to change our habits and uh, to you know, develop healthier habits and maybe affect weight status change. I think absolutely we can, but we need to do it sensitively and in a way that doesn't put too much pressure on children. You know, one of the concerns uh, with today and in society is there's such an emphasis on thinness you know, and a push for dieting that oftentimes we see kids engaging in dietary habits that are counterproductive. Kids will start to skip meals. They may be fasting, they may be engaging in binging or purging types of activities, I should say. Engaging in extreme levels of physical activity. I would call those unhealthy weight control behaviors. And oftentimes what we see at those is they can be gateway behaviors into more severe eating disorder types of behaviors. And oftentimes when we see kids overemphasize dieting 
in engaging in those types of behaviors, unhealthy weight control behaviors, or even some more healthy weight control behaviors like you know, cutting back on high fat foods. If we're, we're focusing so much on that aspect, sometimes we can see you know, more weight gain because we're making worse choices in the long run. So I think how much we push dieting and as parents, if we become overly restrictive in trying to exhibit and, engage and use too much control of the children's diet, I think that can be a problem. I think parents do need to be aware. And I do think moderate elements of control are good, like providing healthy choices uh, for kids, providing better options for kids, I think are, are great. But we want to make sure that we're not encouraging drastic changes across the board and we're putting such a push on kids that they're feeling the pressure and they start engaging in, I would say, these less than healthy weight control types of behaviors. So um, speaking back to um, about how obesity might affect children and adolescents, how might being overweight or obese affect a child or adolescent's mental health? Okay. Well, I'm going to focus most on mental health, but I think I do want to comment that you know, there's, I think it's pretty well accepted that you know, overweight and obesity is linked with a number of negative health outcomes. You know, kids that are overweight are more likely to be overweight and obese adults. They're at greater risk for type 2 diabetes, sleep apnea, a number of cardiovascular risk problems, you know, bone health and joint problems. So there are a number of things that we can be concerned about with that. Um, but you know, certainly there are some potentially significant psychosocial impacts. And you know, not all kids that are going to be overweight or obese uh, are going to exhibit some of these psychosocial you know, distressors or stressors, if you say. But we do know that kids that are obese are at greater risk for being stigmatized. You know, there's clear data that, unfortunately, you know, obese youth in general uh, are looked upon less favorably than their non-obese peers. And this phenomenon can start as early as the preschool years. So we see that some children are more likely to be victims of peer victimization, may have um, you know, more depressive symptoms, may have lower body image or lower self-esteem. I mean, there are concerns with you know, overall quality of life, what it talks about physical abilities and emotional and social functioning that sometimes can be a little bit lower. So you know, it's not that you know, every child that is overweight or obese has these difficulties, but there are some concerns and there are at greater risk for some of those challenges I just mentioned. How much of this, you know, a child being overweight or obese, how much of that is genetic? Can parents really do something to, to change this, to change their, you know, especially if they see that it runs in the family? Certainly, certainly. You know, like with most uh, behaviors and most of our physical characteristics, mm -hmm. um, it's usually a combination of both in the sense that genetics and our interactions and our behaviors, our interactions with the environment and our behaviors impact you know, our physical characteristics. And certainly genes are important in that they set kind of a range of where one might fall as far as their, their characteristics and their fat and, and at levels of adiposity. Okay? And certainly there are some genetic conditions like Prater Willie and others that are greatly associated with being obese. Okay? Um, but for most folks, you know, there is that range that we might fall, but then we look at behaviors and what is our dietary intake, our physical activity, our sedentary behaviors, and those then play a really significant role and you know, within that maybe predetermined range that our genes may give us, how then do we manifest ourselves? And if we look at you know, the dramatic increases in adult and childhood obesity that we've seen, in the last you know, 30 to 40 years. And from 1970 to the year 2000, we've seen almost a 400% increase in the prevalence of childhood obesity. You know, that short-term increase is not due to just changes in our genes. Okay? Over time, we see long-term, decades, uh, centuries. Okay? But for that short-term change, we're talking about changes in our eating habits and our physical activity. And there may be other environmental aspects that could be contributing to how much we burn energy and the different aspects of how much we take in. But it certainly comes down to what we call the energy of balance equation. How much are we taking in and then how many calories are we burning? 
through phys physical activity and our meta metabolism. Okay, so it sounds like parents can still have the chance to intervene quite a bit Great. Um, despite their family history. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there's certainly a lot of things that parents can do to help their kids. You know, we want kids to also learn and to tar start taking responsibility too. Obviously, you know, four or five, you know, we want to, it's more about setting the environment. But as kids get older, hopefully they can learn more and start making healthier choices and working with their parents to do that. Um, but, you know, I think we have to acknowledge it's not easy. You know, families have a lot going on. You got families with parents that are work, you know, both parents are working. You got single parent families. You got families with a lot of responsibilities. And it's a challenge to dedicate the time and energy to help providing healthier meals, and to getting out and being active with your kids. I mean, it's not easy. And, you know, a lot of our um, research, if you will, has shown that you know, we can have some effects, some positive effects in helping kids make short-term changes, but then trying to maintain that over time is really challenging because, you know, we look at our environment and there's so many cues, so many things out there for, you know, uh, eating larger portion sizes of high-fat foods, being less active. So, there, you know, I want to acknowledge that it is difficult for parents and kids to make changes but I think it's something that we all have to work at doing, both kids and families together, but also at higher levels, you know, communities, uh, schools, churches, or community organizations, and even at higher levels in state and local go and, and national government. What can we do about how the environment is set up to help make things more, you know, uh, active? How can we be more active? What can we do about regulations that maybe control marketing that's targeting kids and families? So I'm going off here on a lot of different directions. So yes, parents and families need to take an active step in this, and there are things that they can do. But we have to realize that there also be, needs to be changes at multiple levels of our environment to help kids and families make effective change. Is there anything else that you think parents or caregivers should really know about pediatric obesity? Um, I think we've covered a number of things. I think as a starting point, and I think all kids can benefit from healthier lifestyles. Uh, and if you're a parent and you're starting to be concerned, certainly talk with your physician. But I think an important thing is keep it simple when you start. Focus on specific behaviors and specific things you can do. Try to cut back on high sugar sweetened beverages that are in the home. Okay. Try to cut back on some of the high fat, high sugar foods that are available right in their home or that are so easily seen and can serve as a cue to eat for kids. Let's increase how much you know, fruits and vegetables are available for kids okay, in the home. Let's try to cut back on how much time kids spend in front of the TV. One, because hopefully they'll be more active, but two, key, the TV often serves as a cue to eat more. Um, so we can focus on some of these simple, easy changes to start um, and then see where it goes from there. And then you can consult with your physician and others. But I think those are some great places to start at along with modeling and being positive and really focus on catching your kids being good and giving them opportunities to be good. Well, thank you so much for being here and answering all of our questions today. Thank you for having me.